First of all, I'd just like to say good evening and welcome to ODI. And I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to attend what I think is going to be a very interesting and important debate. And to those of you online watching from around the world, thank you also for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Wendy Fenton, and I'm the coordinator of the Humanitarian Practice Network here at ODI, and I'm going to be your chair tonight. Um, as you all know, in August 2015, South Sudan's government and the armed opposition signed a peace agreement aimed at ending the civil war that started in December 2013. While the signing was important, it was clear that the proposed administrative and power-sharing arrangements would be challenging to implement. And two months after the agreement was signed, President Salva Kiir issued a decree subdividing South Sudan's existing 10 states into 28, which created additional uncertainty about the implementation of the peace deal. Now, these are all important challenges, but the South Sudan peace agreement also offers opportunities. And we're delighted to have here tonight with us an expert panel who are going to discuss some of these key challenges and opportunities from their different perspectives. But before I introduce them, please do put your phones on silent. <laughs> Significant pause, <laughs> including the panel members. <laughs> But, but do feel free to tweet using the hashtag ODI South Sudan. And you can follow us too on at ODI Dev. And it, just to say if the fire alarm sounds, please make your way out of the building through the, the front doors by ODI's reception. And I, I'd like to emphasize that you should know that this event is being, is live. So it is being live streamed and there will be a video made um, from the recording. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. On my left is our key speaker tonight, Luca Biong Deng. I asked him if he wanted to be called professor and doctor, which are titles that he's entitled to, but he wants to be called Luca Biong Deng, and that's what I'm going to call him. And he's a recognized expert on the affairs of Sudan South Su and South Sudan in areas of poverty, vulnerability, famine, civil wars, constitution making, and state building. Luca is an associate professor at Juba University's College of Social and Economic Studies, and he's also a global fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, PRIO. He's an associate fellow at Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and also a fellow at the Rifali Institute. Uh, Luca served from 2006 until May 2011 as a minister in the office of the President of South Sudan and as a National Minister of Cabinet Affairs of the Sudan. And he's also worked as a senior economist for the World Bank and served as a director of the Center for Peace and Development Studies at the University of Juba. He's also in charge of Kush Inc., which is a nonprofit organization which promotes peace, stability, and development with a particular focus on South Sudan and the Abia area. Luke has published a number of scholarly articles in a wide array of international journals and contributed many chapters um, to various books. Now, Luke is going to be our main speaker here. He's going to give us some thoughts from his perspective. And afterwards, we're going to ask our discussants here, um, and I'm going to introduce them in just a moment, to comment on his presentation. Um, and let me just introduce them briefly. Leban Moro, who's on my far right here, is acting director of the Center for Peace and Development Studies in Juba, where he also teaches graduate courses in the areas of development, conflict, forced migration, and humanitarian affairs. And Leban is also a senior researcher with the Secure Livelihoods Research Consortium here at ODI. Leban's the director of international and alumni affairs and an associate professor at the University of Juba. And his research is primarily on development-induced displacement and resettlement, focusing on oil, conflict, and displacement in South Sudan. He has conducted fieldwork in South Sudan, Egypt, Uganda, and Kenya, and he's published widely in a number of academic journals and news outlets. On my far left here is Martina Sanchi, and she's a senior researcher in the Statehood and Conflict Program at Swiss Peace and a lead researcher with the Secure Livelihoods Research Consortium. Martina wrote her doctoral thesis in social anthropology at the University of Bern, focusing on statehood, local governance, 
and citizen-state relations in northern Bahar al-Ghazal in South Sudan. And she has extensive field research experience in South Sudan, DRC, and Uganda, and much of her work is focused on local justice, customary law, traditional authorities, socio-political structures, land governance, and conflict resolution. And last but not least, on my immediate right, is Dr. Marika Shomaris, who's a research fellow in politics and governance at the Overseas Development Institute. And for the past 10 years, Marika's worked extensively in Sudan and South Sudan, conducting and overseeing a range of research activities. Marika's published on the resolution of violent conflict, civilian military relations, use of information technology, media and evidence in situations of conflict and political contestation, knowledge and power, provisions of civilian security, and articulations of justice and security by actors in situations of violent conflict. Anything else? That's quite a long list. <laughs> So, as you see, we've got a very experienced and very erudite panel, and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Now, let's start off with Luca, please. The floor okay. is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Wendy, and for ODI for giving us this opportunity to share with you what is happening in South Sudan. <coughs> so, the, uh, the way I would like to, uh, to start is to... Uh, I will be asking really very these basic questions, and I believe I will be talking with a, a crowd which is so knowledgeable. I will be repeating myself, and uh, forgive me for that. <laughs> it's just a method of making point rather than actually giving you any additional information. But really to ask ourselves this fundamental question, what went wrong in South Sudan? And um, how can we understand it? And and what are the impacts of this conflict? And are there opportunities that we can be tapping on to bring this country back to, to the path of, of, uh, of, of, of peace? I know each of you who is here in this room, in one way or another, you contributed your feelings in seeing this country to be a successful story. And because all of us, we put a lot of efforts in seeing it through that this country should make a difference, and it came out at the time when we have a world report uh, on the peace, security, and development. And I think everyone was so committed and hopeful that this country must must live to the uh, to the challenge and the experience of the of the international community of how we can make difference of a country coming out of war. But here again, we are in war, just dreams. And actually, there's a country that affected each of us here in this room. It's this South Sudan, because we push a lot of expectations. And here again, we are sitting together now to talk about conflict and human tragedy in this, in this country that we are touched so much. Without this despair, really, we would like to ask these fundamental questions about what went wrong. And I, I'm just putting these things because it is very important to put in the context. Uh, I, uh, Southern Sudan went into various transitions, and these transitions happened at the same time. And all of us, we know these transitions always are very bumpy, very challenging. And the first transition is transition from civil war to, to peace in 2005. And coupled with that, you are having this transition from liberation movement to government, and I think Many people have written a lot about this issue of any liberation movement coming out of war to govern is always a very difficult uh, task. But even the third transition, actually, by the time these things were happening, South Sudan was preparing itself to be an independent country. So these, these, these three transitions happened at the same time for, for this country. But then having this big shock, the shock of losing the leader, Dr. John, because that's the man who was having a lot of vision how to, how to, how to build this country. People will talk whether can counterfactually, if he were to be alive, where we're going to be in the same status or not. And then the curse of oil, and what people term as the curse of liberation, uh, depending almost about 98% on, on oil. But then the CPA itself, the way it was implemented, was implemented with this um, win-lose strategy by the NCP and SPLM. 
they were not looking at a, a common ground of win-win situation. So they entered into this peace agreement. I never would like just to add perform the others. So now we have unfinished business of CPA, but also we have a legacy of the past because a lot of grievances, but we buried them. We decided not to, to, to address them. And coupled with all these weak institutions, and, um, but the most important thing is these four traps of the bottom billion of Collier. I know some people may agree with it, but, but this is the, 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 the four traps of bottom billion are quite clear case of how South Sudan is actually in the middle of all these four, the four traps, whether it being in civil war or happened to, to enter into civil war, or whether it is a, a land, I mean, landlocked country with natural resources. It's coming also from a prolonged bad policies from the Sudan government. So in actual fact, South Sudan is, you can term it as the bottom of the bottom billion. And it's immersed into this world and entered into this classification. And so, so these are the things that, that, so when we talk about what went wrong, we need to, uh, to, to really uh, uh, look at this, this, this reality. How best to understand it? This is how it is projected. At the moment when you talk about Southern Sudan, immediately what will come to your mind? Dinka, Nuer. This is an example when they are entering into a refugee camp or just a very clear arrow, Nuer and Dinka. If you are not, <laughs> you could clearly see in between. There's nothing in between. And this is the way we have been, the, the, the war itself, the conflict in Southern Sudan, is being portrayed as a conflict, ethnic conflict between these main ethnic groups. But I believe it is better that we should widen our understanding in, in looking at conflict in a sense that in most cases people look at the at one level. And I believe it is very important to look horizontally and vertically, especially you look at the community level, national level, and then the regional level, global level. So this interconnection in looking at conflict at these different levels will help us to have a better understanding in resolving it. Usually at the level of the community, clear case of grievances, and then at the national level, always a clear case of issues of institutions and bad governance. And then at the regional level, you have a very narrow national, um, national interest to shape the relationship with. I will give you an example later on about the role of Sudan in this. And then the global, when you come to the multinational cooperation and the whole of the politics of aid. So it, it's very important to, 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 to put in this context in understanding the, the conflict. So what are the impacts? I will look at these three, two shocks that happened to South Sudan. The, the, the conflict itself, but then the global oil shock, because this is a country depending entirely on oil. Now, let me, this is, this is a, um, a facility that is available, uh, ACLD, uh, is actually recording most of the conflict events and the fatalities. And you could clearly see between Sudan and South Sudan a very high level up before the, the, civil, before the CPA and the, and the fatalities in terms of human death toll. And then it started increasing immediately at a very high level. Although we don't know at the moment how many people died, but it is a clear case, the very fact we cannot know even how many died. It is, it is, it is uh, even a crime. So people are struggling about how many people died. Maybe 10,000, 50,000. We need to discover. But what, you, what, what is the interesting thing between these two figures of Sudan and South Sudan? It is how these two countries are born by conflict. <laughs> Francis Deng wrote about it. And, uh, you could see even the pattern of the conflict events seem to be following the same, the same pattern. So, a lot of people died in this, in this war. But even the violence against civilians is being recorded. I think when you look at the human rights record and the, uh, even the African Union Commission of Inquiry, you get a lot of, a lot of information about the, the violence against civilians. The civilians are paying a high price. But even the, the militarization of ethnic groups, because it is not about Dinka, it's about all ethnic groups because the state itself is unable to protect and then you get the people are getting themselves to, to defend themselves. So militarization of, of ethnic group is a very huge thing that is going to face, because with it, a lot of mistrust and, and, uh, between the, the communities. And uh, maybe I will talk later on about the issue of non-state actors when you talk about the peace agreement. So 
one thing that is being captured, which is very important when we talk about, if at all we are going to have peace, the level of trauma in South Sudan. Uh, there's a Southern Sudan Law Society together with UNDP. They, uh, they conducted a survey about the level of trauma, and they found Southern Sudan, the level of trauma is about 41%. And when you compare to normal situation, it would be about 7%. In actual fact, that level of trauma is comparable to Rwanda and then uh, Cambodia, where, where genocide were committed in those areas. So it's a huge thing that we are going to, to, to deal with when we, when we are going to have peace in, this, in, this, uh, in South Sudan. Um, a food security situation is very clear about not less than 4 million people are food insecure. Um, the, the fragility is very clear case how South Sudan is even replacing Somalia in terms of level of fragility. And this is where you have a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, under, un underlying the, 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 the challenges that facing South Sudan. The status of uh, freedom is a clear case. South Sudan now in terms of it's not, not a secure, you know, the a peace, uh, it's a freedom uh, country. A lot of abuses in terms of human rights. I think it has come into attention that the, 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 the level of, uh, of, of human rights abuses. And it's clear that in the case of the African Union Commission to Inquiry, whether Human Rights Watch and all these records are indicating the, uh, uh, the, uh, the status of freedom in this country. Then the, the, the most important thing is the Uyghur institutions. Uh, I use the CPIA, uh, the World, World Bank, and actually Southern Sudan, just like uh, Eritrea, having the lowest uh, score on the CPIA. And actually, even after the peace, I mean, after the war, is actually the, the, the status of the institutions and, and policies are coming even weaker. So you should not, so it's very important to see the, the damage that being caused by, by this. Now, coupled with this, when you have this big shock of the, of the, of the, of the oil, uh, and and um, and this is happened at the same time when you have this conflict. Uh, there are a lot of projection. Uh, we know I don't want to bother you about the politics around it. People are saying there's a likelihood that it may go even later. I mean, we go to 25. Some are even going to about five dollar per bottle, and the, and it's going to have a very serious consequence on South Sudan. This example from the World Bank, they made assessment about the impact of this shock of oil, 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 oil decline. To the to the uh, to the uh, to the oil exporters, developing countries like South Sudan, it's almost taking about 0.7 percent of the GDP. I'm not talking about the the cost of the uh, of the of the conflict itself, but that how much this 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 this, this uh, oil shock is going to affect the uh, the South. Now, this is how how the channeling of this impact, whether uh, because the World Bank used this metal to see by the end of the day what is this. You have the oil, and then you have the, the, the conflict. By the end of the day, it will end up a high level of poverty, high level of inflation that I will show you. Now, this World Bank, they use two parameters, a potential physical impact, and then the, uh, the, uh, the, the balance of payment. And they use these, these two, whether the country is actually benefiting from these shocks, or, or, or neutral, or, or, or negative. Southern Sudan, along these two parameters, is having negative. I think the most affected country, I could say, in the world because of this oil, oil shock. Now, even when you come to these two factors, you look at the physical deficit. As we talk now, there's, there's no appropriate budget you can talk about in South Sudan. The, the budget that they have now, they can only mobilize about 30% of the revenues Two, so you have about 7% uh, budget deficit. The real GDP, you cannot talk even, is actually declining. And, and then also, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, there's a, a very interesting thing happened about this foreign exchange. They, they have now a floating exchange rate, which I think it was advisable for the government to, 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 to devalue the currency. <laughs> but it has done in such a way that they have not put right the, pol the, the, the context, the political context. And what is happening is that the citizens are paying a very high price. I think the inflation now is, is, is extremely very high. It's, it's more than 150%. But, but then the, it is, that one is going to create even a lot of social unrest in a sense that the, the, the public service, that they have increased the, the, the salary by about 300%. But then you have the normal citizen actually is going to pay even a higher price for this one. 
So inflation is even getting very high. Projection about the about poverty is, is is increasing. It's because of all these factors. So you could say this is the uh, the uh, the uh, this is the level of inflation. It's actually by uh, towards the eight, beginning of the year was about uh, 109, but now is even after the floating exchange rate is even higher than this one. Now, but that is not only that's not only South Sudan. The cost to South Sudan, to the region and international community. We did some work on the cost of war. And this is, uh, uh, it has been, for South Sudan, it is, it is almost about uh, 20, 20, 28 to, to million, um, billion US dollars if peace agreement is not, is not being uh, signed. And I, we are seeing a very a clear case of uh, military expenditure increase. Almost everybody is working on the, whatever resource available is being directed to the, to the, to the military. To the region, I think it is very important we estimated, it was estimated not less than 50 something billion. But in, interestingly, Sudan, for the first time, they said they have lost about 7 billion US dollars for the closure of the border with, with South Sudan. And, and it is interesting that now the economic interest of the region is coming up very clearly to see the importance of South Sudan for, for, for the region, to see it as, as important for their economy. Even for the uh, international community, in terms of peacekeeping, humanitarian assistance, you could, you could have saved something like 30, 30 billion US dollars. So all of us, the South Sudanese, the region, the international community is paying the price. So it's a very, a very, a, a very, a very, a very important for us to look at that, all these dimension. Are there opportunities? I am, I'm putting the, the following. First, the current peace agreement. I think it's an agreement that is being uh, that has shown a solidarity and unity within the region and the international community. I think when I compare it to the CPA, it more or less the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was between, I could say the region was so involved. But this one, I think the region and international community were together in, in, uh, in supporting this agreement. Also for the first time to have other stakeholders being involved in it, especially the other political parties, uh, the civil society, and these new forces, the youth and women, being involved in this peace agreement. Maybe the level is different, but to a certain degree, actually becoming even signatory to, to this agreement. What is missing, like the CPA, the non-state security actors. And these non-state security actors, they played a very important role in this, in this, in this war. Whether it is White Army, Gil Wing or Tid Wing, uh, to a certain degree now we have the Arrow Boys in Western Equatoria. But they have never been involved in this, in this, in this peace agreement. And there's a debate about whether they, are, they could be a good followers for the, the people in Juba, or do they have their own grievances and their own agenda? And if they are left, I think it's one of the, some of the weaknesses we are seeing in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in this agreement. These, the, the parties, especially the warring parties, they signed this agreement reluctantly. And, uh, and it's a fact, especially the, the, the government made a very clear reservation about this agreement. Yet, I think it is very important to highlight the point that the people of South Sudan overwhelmingly supported this peace agreement. We did some work even by the time I was the Center for Peace and Development Studies, and that everybody, because there's no other option for people of Southern except this peace agreement. It is a peace that is accepted by it, how bad it is. But people believe this is the, the, the peace that we... Even the parliament of, of South Sudan in Juba, when the agreement was presented to the parliament, they accepted, they, they, passed, they, 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 they passed this agreement without reservation. Although the government raised concern about, about a series of reservations, but they passed it without reservation, showing that that is the choice of the people of South Sudan. Yeah. But, but, but then we, 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 when you look carefully to this agreement, you see clearly a very serious serious institutional and policy reform. I could say South Sudan, if this peace agreement is implemented, it's not going to be the same again. Whether it is an economic and, uh, and an institutional reform, whether reform in the, in the oil sector, a very detailed one, uh, whether in defense and security sector reform, for the first time they have come with a very comprehensive, in terms of accountability uh, and the hybrid court, uh, and in terms of the system of government. It, we ha South Sudan has been always talking about what type of system of government, even during the colonial period and after the, 
after the independence of Sudan. For the first time, that at least to recognize federalism as the best system of governance for South Sudan. But it has never been settled. Um, so I believe South Sudan will not be the same again if we implement this agreement. But, but then what, what are the, we are seeing in implementation itself? Serious delay, I could say the matrix for implementation of this peace agreement was rather very optimistic, was not realistic. But yet there's some progress that we need to recognize. One of them, there was that workshop which was conducted on the ceasefire. You see these generals to come together. That was a very beginning of building the trust between the warring parties, these generals to come together. They delayed in signing the minutes, but eventually they, they signed it. The formation of uh, uh, joint uh, monitoring and evaluation commission, I think that's a very important. And even the sheer person is somewhat so recognized and respected. Then the whole lot of allocation of portfolio of the ministries. You know they have this lottery in the peace agreement that everyone should pick this one and the second to pick the other one. So there was a lot of uncertainties. This is how it was put in the, in the peace agreement. And it's one of the good things that the, the, the SPLM in opposition, one day one, especially the Tabanding, he decided to say, look, let us forget about this lottery business. Let us sit and discuss, and then we, we can agree. And actually, they sat down, and they, and they agreed in of how to allocate this portfolio. For me, that's the beginning. For me, it's a very how much with, within South Sudan is that they can be able to solve their own problem, rather than the peace agreement, and for them to think out of the box. And that one was a very important signal that this party, they can do more work on the year. And, and the presence of the SPLM in opposition and the former detainees in Juba actually is a very positive thing. So the business is not the same in Juba today. Because at least somebody, somehow there, is watching how things are happening. They may have some problem, but I think the president is making a lot of, uh, a lot of difference. One thing which is very small, it was when they, they, there was a problem of paying the accommodation, because they, the Troika, the international community, committed to pay for the parties until the 22nd of, uh, of, of, of last month. But then the Troika and the international community said, we are not going to pay. At least the, com the government generously came in to, to, to cover the bill, which it was a very good sign. And I think at least for South Sudanese to be able to pay for the, for the cost of this, uh, uh, for, for the cost of the, the implementation of this agreement. One thing which I think also positive, you, might, you know about the Arusha peace agreement, uh, the Arusha reunification of the SPLM. The convention that was conducted recently, they have incorporated the Arusha, the provisions of Arusha, Arusha agreement. And Arusha agreement is a huge reform within the SPLM because the genesis of crisis is started within the SPLM. And this Arusha agreement actually reforming the SPLM. And for the, for the convention, and then the incorporation of this agreement into the SPLM constitution is a positive, is a positive thing. Now we have some of these challenges. One of the problems I'm seeing clearly is the whole lot of funding of this agreement. It's so cumbersome, very, a lot of resources, a lot of things. There's also this election fever and politics of patronage. The politics around 28 state and 21 state. It's a clear case of everybody is just calculating. Uh, the parts are calculating the election going to come by the end of the, of the interim period. And then the... Uh, there is also sequencing between the uh, amendment of the constitution and formation of the transitional government of national unity. I think this is some of the things that we, because sometimes we're coming deterministic in terms, everything must go this way, you may face a problem. I'm one of the people I believe it should not, the issue of the 28 states should not be, should not be a stumbling block in the formation of the government of national unity. Because what could happen, and I, I, what could happen, you could have the constitution of South Sudan, the current constitution, but have the peace agreement to be the basis upon which you can govern the interim period until the parties agree. And it is good that there's something coming out now from the EGAD communique, whereby they said the parties could be able to form the, the government of national unity and use this, uh, the, uh, the peace agreement as the basis of governing during this period. Of, it, it may sound very, very, very unrealistic because I believe the whole of the 20s should not be stumbling blocks. One thing that I see is a problem also is the JAMAC, the joint uh, monitoring and, 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 and evaluation commission. Pe if people start looking at it as the last resort of solving the problem, it may indicate that potential people have to discuss among themselves in resolving their own conflict. And I'm happy that the commission of the, of the, of the uh, I mean the chairperson of the commission has been asking the parties 
to think out of the box rather than resorting to the uh, to the to the commission to be to be the uh, to be the, the last resort the last one also is building the trust between president selfa and Riek. i think it's going to be a big a big a big a big a big challenge and i think the church can can play a very important role now other opportunities i am seeing international community i think sudan is emerging as a very important uh, 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 country. I'm, I pick Sudan in particular because Sudan has a very unique relationship with the SPLM in opposition and also with the, uh, with, with, the, uh, and with the government in Juba. And they can play a very good role in helping the parties to come together and resolve the pending issues, including issues to do with the 2080 state. And uh, uh, the other one is, is the, the peace or the, the national dialogue that is happening in Sudan now. I think having stability and peace in Sudan will, will have a very important impact on the, uh, on the, for example, the cooperation agreement having this issue of four freedoms, issue of past release, issue of trade. I think it is very important that we, uh, yeah, we can. And then unfinished business, like the issue of ABA, the two, uh, two areas. We may need also to look at the, the United Nations Security Council um, uh, panel of experts report about the possible sanctions. And I think it is, we need to look at it in such a way, it should not be used in such a way not to actually to be a tipping point that can create a lot of, derail the process of implementation of peace agreement. But it is a, a necessary pressure, but to be managed in a, such a way not to, not to affect the, uh, the whole of accountability should we have peace and, and, and justice, or should we have justice later on? I think the fact that we have to have peace, sequencing the account, I mean, justice and, I mean peace and justice, but don't to forget the, uh, the issue of justice, because I think it is very important. And I think this issue of hybrid court is very important. And, and we can use also the experience of, uh, of Kenya in terms of the... Uh... Now, the, the, last question, the last issue that I want to raise, the humanitarian and development aid. Can, can we do it different this time? Have we learned from it? Because can we make a difference? Because Southern Sudan is one of the countries that actually receive a hell of humanitarian assistance. Is it possible we can do it differently this time to contribute to, to the peace and building the institutions in South Sudan? So let me stop here and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for that very thought-provoking presentation, Luca. I'm sure that uh, in addition to the reactions from our discussants, we're going to have many questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to start off by um, handing the floor over to Leban to give us his uh, reactions first. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to begin by thanking ODI, ODI sorry, <laughs> especially Maria uh, Maraika, Sonia and Fiona for making it possible for me to come and participate in this event. It is really great <laughs> to be back in the UK and to enjoy the pleasant weather. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if you have been in Juba, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think Luca has really made a detailed and comprehensive uh, presentation. And um, what I will be doing is really to emphasize certain things that he has said <laughs> or things he has raised. I want to begin by saying the issue of ending the war in South Sudan and establishing peace is a critical one. I'm sure <coughs> some of you, maybe many of you, are aware that the fighting has not totally ended throughout the country. In fact, the clashes being reported in Western Equatoria, and people are being forced to flee to DRC Congo. And this is a problem. As the war continues, then more and more people will be in need of humanitarian assistance. Uh, recently, we heard from the UN or a UN official that the people who are now in need of assistance are over six million. 
And uh, also coupled with the economic crisis that uh, Luca has uh, highlighted, is the crisis could become really very uh, huge. I live and work in Juba, and I can tell you that it is really tough for people over there. Things that we used to get easily, like water and food, is no longer, well, I complain, I'm in a better position. What about the other people? It should be, things are not very good. So that alone really means that the war has to come to an end. Also less recognized is the fact that uh, ethnic or the divisions that are caused by the war as the hostilities go on become deeper and deeper. So as the war continues, the dream of building a united South Sudanese nation really will become more distant. And that the process of healing and reconciliation will become difficult to achieve in the near future. Uh, turning to the issue of the peace process or the compromise peace agreement, I also agree with Luca that it is the best option of ending the crisis or the war in the country. It doesn't satisfy the interests of all, but it offers the best chance to, to, for us to have peace and stability. I think for me what is really crucial is implementation. I think for me really the crucial thing is implementation. I'm sure all peace-loving South Sudanese want the war to end and reconciliation to begin uh, very soon. And I also think that this can only happen if the regional and international powers continue to support and persuade the parties to commit to what they have signed up to. I think this is very crucial. It is really for the regional, our, our neighbors, Ending the war is, is, a, is, a, is very important because the impact is really falls on also on them. There are refugees in Uganda, refugees going to Kenya, many people now fleeing to Sudan. Actually, during the war also, I mean, in, uh, in December 2013, my, also my family also fled to Uganda. So it will also affect the neighboring countries. So it is really important to, to end this so that we have peace in South Sudan, or also our neighbors can concentrate on development rather than really focusing on dealing with problems coming from, from South Sudan. For the international community, I think recently they are appealing for 1.3 billion for humanitarian assistance. This is huge. Suppose this one was supposed to go to development. If the war had ended and it goes to development, I think it would, be, it would, it would really be very, uh, be very great. So it is really important for us as South Sudanese, for the region, and for the international community to do all they can to bring the, the war to an end. I think Luca also mentioned that the agreement was not readily accepted by everybody. So we cannot expect it to be readily implemented by people. Because, I mean, people, some people even went as far as saying that it was imposed. So supporting, if, if support to the parties <coughs> is to win, I think it will take a long time before we can really see real peace in, in our country. Of course, while talking about 
supporting the parties or persuading the parties to commit to what they sign up to. There are also other things that can be done, like um, local efforts to reconcile communities. And in this respect, NGOs and civil society organizations can play a good role. But also, the local civil society organizations need a lot of support. I know some of them, we did a study recently, they struggle a lot in terms of funding, uh, which is very unpredictable. Really, they struggle. So they also need uh, a lot of uh, support. Also, we know that the space for them to operate has become also narrower as the hostilities uh, continue. <coughs> I think, uh, once again, I would like to say thank you to ODI, <coughs> Maraika, and the others for having me here. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Levin, for those uh, considered comments. Um, Martina, I'm going to turn to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm very glad that I have the chance to share some thoughts with you tonight, thanks to SLRC and ODI. Um, I would like to shed light on local justice and local peace processes, um, because I think they are very, very important also at this point in time, because they can help to foster peace and reconciliation at the local level. Um, as you all know, local justice and uh, local mechanisms of conflict mitigation are continuously settling disputes at the local level in South Sudan. I mean, all kinds of disputes, be it family disputes, but also disputes related to property such as land and cattle are settled, settled and resolved at the local level. Um, these processes are not really at the, at the spotlight, but they are very important because they prevent that small-scale disputes um, can uh, escalate, actually, into intra- and intercommunal com conflicts and violence. <coughs> I think it's very important that we don't forget that these processes are, or mechanisms are still working. And they also work, although maybe to a limited extent, in areas that are affected by, by the armed conflict. Moreover, South Sudan has a very long history of local peace processes. The Wunlit peace process is, most, is probably the most well known, but there are other local peace processes who had been going on in the past and are all going on at this point in time. And they're very important because they um, at least temporarily stop armed violence and conflict. And it's the church and traditional authorities besides other uh, groups who play a very important role in these processes. It is important to me, for me to stress the significance of the local justice mechanisms and local peace process because of two reasons. First of all, I think they are kind of a continuity or constitute a continuity in South Sudan because um, they are there and they foster rule, law, rule of law, stability, peace and reconciliation at the local level. They do this in times of peace but also during times of armed conflict. And secondly, I also find them very important because I think that they provide opportunities at this moment in time to actually try to provide, uh, to foster peace and reconciliation at the local level. But I don't want to romanticize them. They have their limitations. We know they do not always work. They do not always prevent armed conflict. And there are uh, a number of issues which also come up or open questions when it comes to engagement with these processes. I would just like to, 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 um, to bring up three questions about which I have been uh, thinking, but I don't know the answer, so I thought maybe it might be useful to bring them up here. Um, one uh, open question relates to the interlink between the high-level processes and the local-level processes. Um, in the peace agreement which was signed last year, um, a number of institutions were referred to that shall be introduced. Um, one of them, or some of them, ref are going or plan to deal with transitional justice, reconciliation, and healing. So one of open question for me is how will these institutions and their practices actually relate to what I have been describing before? How are these processes going to relate to each other? Uh, another issue which um, came up in the past, or I observed in the past, is the nature of support to local level peace processes. Um, frequently, 
support by international actors to local peace processes is very um, specific. They often support one event or a series of e events. And I'm wondering what could be done that the support could be changed in a way that it takes the process-like um, nature of local level peace processes better into account. And thirdly, um, often international actors who try to support local peace processes and reconciliation in South Sudan, they really aim at working with local institutions like church leaders or churches and traditional authorities. But what then happens in practice is that this engagement is limited or it's rather externally driven. So what, what can be done that, that this uh, changes? How can be support framed in a uh, can how can support be framed in a way that it becomes more participatory and more um, locally driven and owned? So these are some of the puzzles and open questions um, which came into my mind um, in relation to local level peace processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Marika. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much to Levin and Luca in particular for wise words and also for long journeys that they've both undertaken to be here. Um, I was struck by the very last line on Luca's slides, which was, can we learn? I don't know if any of you saw that. And I think that's the question that um, actually needs to be put up there probably in cat capital letters. And I want to ask that question really of the, the broader research and maybe international community can we learn? And my answer would be maybe, but I think we also need to turn the lens on the people who have tried to contribute to learning in the past. And I want to, I want to clarify what exactly I'm, I mean by that in two ways. One is I find it really striking, and Martina has just also made the point, that any piece needs to be inclusive or participatory. It needs to reach the people of South Sudan. I think we all agree on this. But in reality, have we really learned what that could even look like and what that might mean? It is actually very difficult to imagine <coughs> really what it, would, what it could mean on an everyday basis to include the people of South Sudan. And why is this so difficult? Because a lot of them do not live in Juba. And a lot of the research that has been conducted to help us learn, to help us understand, is being conducted in Juba or in a very, very narrow slice of South Sudan. We did a review a few years ago of all research that had been done since the signing of the CPA. And it was overwhelming the, to the extent to which the empirical data that was being used to draw very broad conclusions about what is life like for South Sudanese was based on interviews conducted in Juba very often interviews conducted amongst aid agencies. That sounds maybe from, a, you know, from one report to the next, maybe that doesn't sound so drastic, but actually if that happens over 10 years, then all of a sudden the question of how a peace agreement signed between two parties who are very prominent in Juba is supposed to reach and have others participate who live maybe in Demzobir or in the northern part of Jonglei becomes really very difficult indeed. So that is a genuine challenge, I think, that, that also the research community needs, needs to take on and needs to be uh, honest about, that it's very hard to learn if everybody continues to speak amongst themselves. Um, and the second part of the can we learn question, I think, again, comes from just looking back over the last 10 years, really, of South Sudanese history, where we have learned one thing, which is that war and peace can fall very, very closely together. And the signing of a peace agreement doesn't bring peace, but it also doesn't mean that war continues in the same way. These are not, these are not clear dichotomies. There's no clear shift from one to the <coughs> next. There's a really fluid line between accepting and rejecting a peace agreement. There's a fluid line between implementing and not implementing a peace agreement. These neat categories of war and peace, of rejection and acceptance, acceptance are really a problem, I think, um, also from the perspective of an international community that is very comfortable engaging when they see peace and very helpless when they see war. They don't really know what to do. And if, you, if we stop thinking about these as neat categories, maybe it can loosen up the way this engagement is conducted as well. There's, there are many examples of the way these neat categories, A and B, are very damaging in our understanding. And, and Luca has shown that very famous picture of 
the two signs of Dinka and Nuer, which is maybe the most stark manifestation of the neat categories that are really not very helpful. And I think there's other points that we, we should remind ourselves of when we think about these neat categories. One could possibly be militarization. There's an assumption now that if we see people fighting, that there's a genuine underpinning belief that that violence is seen as a very useful tool to reach a goal. It's quickly equated with a military mindset. It's, again, a clear division between people who like war and people who like peace. And very often, of course, this is not the case. People's experience of being caught up in a situation where they might need protection, where, as Luca said, some of these militias emerge that offer protection, and then sometimes that protection turns into warlike activities. Again, it's a very fluid experience of what it actually means to be in a, in a situation where negotiation is an aspect of everyday life. Another really common division that everyone makes is the division between state and non-state actors. And there is always an assumption that if you support one of them, then you don't support the other. And some of the research work that uh, I've done with my colleague Anouk Richtering in past years has taught us something very interesting indeed, that actually sometimes that people who support non-state military actors also support the state military actors. And people who support local traditional authorities, the, the ones that Martina mentioned, also support the political national government. So actually, it's very counterintuitive to how we would often see a division. And I think this is, again, a reminder that there's uh, you know, very strong beliefs within South Sudan that there is a way of military governing, there's a way of politically government, and not everybody supports these in equal terms. And not everybody experiences governments along these clear dividing lines of state and non-state. <coughs> so dividing lines are not neat. And that sounds like an obvious statement to make, but I think it's one that's important to make over and over again because it influences how people engage with South Sudan. Because not having neat dividing lines is a very challenging moment for broader analysis. But I also think it's a genuine opportunity to understand that these dividing lines are not neat. It's a genuine opportunity to understand and to learn. And I, I think the answer to the question that was the last line on Luca's slides, can we learn, is yes, but it will require a continued open eyes, open ears, feet that are willing to walk a little bit further and communication channels to be kept open at all times. And then I think, yes, we can learn, but it's not going to happen automatically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting comments, Marika. Now I want we're we're uh, it's six twenty-five, so we want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Now, what I, I understand, we have only one roving microphone, so I'm going to have to do the room in segments here. So I'm going to start off with the right-hand side of the room and take uh, two or three questions, given the numbers of people that we have. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please uh, raise your hand. If you could identify yourself and any institutional affiliation you have and keep your question as brief as possible and to the point. Thank you. Any questions? Ah. Oh, well, OK. Marcus. <laughs> Even if I know your name, you please restate it. 